Well, good evening to you. This is our final class, uh, class number 16 on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I pray and hope that you have enjoyed some of the things that you have learned. Uh, obviously, this is the uh, first uh, portion of this study. There is TH-464B, and uh, I would like to give you just a little bit of uh, introduction into that if you choose to take that particular course. Um, it will be a study in Romans chapter 8. Now you may ask me, well, why in the world would you spend all of that time in just one chapter if you were studying the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, the reason is, is because from verse 1 probably all the way through verse 27 in the book of Romans is the most extensive teaching, the most... Uh, uh, intensive area in all of Scripture that talks about the work of the Spirit. There are probably 15, 16, 17 different areas that are spoken of referring to His particular work, and uh, we want to take a good close look at that. I would say to you that <clears throat> it will be more exegetical. Um, uh, it will still have a lot of practical application for our life. I mean, if you get to something there where it says that we are, uh, if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Well, that has a lot of implications to our life. The next verse says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so we will talk about those kind of practical aspects, but at the same time, it will be a very uh, exegetical study. I have to say from a personal perspective that um, the book of Romans has been my life work. I've been a Christian for uh, almost 43 years and probably 40 of those years I've spent studying the book of Romans. Uh, I've written extensively on it and uh, I'm not in a book form but just uh, in developing studies and courses that I have developed over the years, and uh, my heart is, is, is in Romans. And, uh, but if I had to choose my favorite chapter in all of the scriptures, it would be Romans chapter 8, and my life verse is Romans chapter 8, verse 28 uh, and 29, especially verse 28, that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are the called according to His purpose. So I would encourage you, uh, if you'd like to follow up on this course, to take that, that course as well. Now, I, I want to uh, <clears throat> begin where we left off the last time. Uh, we were looking at the particular verse where, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 8, where Paul indicated that he had suffered the loss of all things, and he counted them as rubbish, that he may actually gain Christ. And uh, we saw that the word for rubbish there actually means, uh, uh, it means manure. I think you would find in some of the uh, different translations that it would actually be translated in some cases as, um, uh, as uh, dung. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a strong word. And, and Paul, uh, it may be uh, translated as refuse in some of the others, but it's a very, very strong term. And Paul was actually telling us that uh, he is willing to suffer loss just, just for the fact that he may gain Christ. Now, I want to make a statement here. Uh, I want you to turn, if you don't mind, in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. It's a very familiar verse. Uh, to all of us, but I want to, I want to make the statement that Christ-likeness, even though it's not what I am going to say, it involves, it involves what we're going to talk about here. Christ-likeness involves simply believing God. There's, there comes a place in my life, in your life, where we, we have to believe God. We have to take Him at his word. We have, there are times when we have to step out in just pure faith. I'm not talking about blind faith. I'm not talking about unreasonable faith. I'm not talking about faith that is, is, is not wise. 
But at the same time, there's a point in our life where we have to believe God. It is believing that He will do what He has said that He will do, uh, what He has promised to do, when we fully commit ourselves to Him. Now, I don't know about you, but I really believe and appreciate. <clears throat> I, I have some incredibly godly friends some men that I have known literally uh, all of my life, people that I met. One, uh, one man is a pastor. I've been a pastor at the same church for 34 years in, in Auburn, Alabama. Just an amazingly godly man. I'm surrounded by men at Covington that teach uh, some of the other um, uh, uh, online courses that you can take, Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Yul Defonso, incredibly, incredibly godly men. And what really sets them apart for me is that they believe God. They're willing to take God at His word and to act on it. And I, I don't know about you, but for me personally, I found that the people that God has used the most, not just in my life, but just in life in, in, in general, are those men and women who have understood what it means to believe God, and then to act on what it is that he has said. Here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it expresses it this way, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. But then Paul adds, in Philippians chapter 2, I want you to look at that, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, that there's also a very human side to this uh, idea, to this area of our sanctification and becoming Christ-like when he says, and I want to add the word here, so just pay close attention, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. This working out of our salvation, this practical outworking of how God, of what we are involved in as it's related to what God is doing in our life, we have to work it out. We have to let it keep being worked out of our life. My part is to trust God. That's my part. My part is to trust God, to believe God to honor his word, not to be questioning everything, every little heaven to have just complete and full understanding about everything. I don't think that I can. I think that uh, when I trust God with my life, when I yield my life to him, that there will always be those areas of the unknown. There will always be those areas. I'm not encouraging you to be foolish. Please do not uh, take what I'm saying that way. I, being foolish is foolish. But there are things in our life where I, I just have to trust God. I, I, I have to believe God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, and empty deceit according to the tradition of men. We are surrounded by tradition. We are surrounded by tradition. I, I am the pastor of a Baptist church, uh, uh, conservative, uh, 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 Baptist congregation and fellowship, And uh, but I can assure you that we have traditions in our church. When I go to Romania, uh, the Orthodox church there is so... Is so into tradition. It's kind of interesting when I go into some of the churches, uh, uh, the men sit on one side of the church and the women sit on the other side. Now I have no idea actually as to why they do that, but literally in every church, uh, Baptist churches, uh, the Orthodox churches, uh, that's that's the way that they sit when they go into into their churches, their traditions, and they feel very strongly about that. Um, 
I, I don't see a scriptural basis for it. Don't simply don't understand it. It's just some tradition that somebody developed in the past. And so he says here, don't let someone cheat you through the traditions. You know, when Christ was teaching in the New Testament, that was certainly one of the areas that he approached the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees with, with was their, their particular traditions. And he refuted those traditions. He actually said that those traditions can actually negate the Word of God, which in many cases they did. And then he says, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. You know, one of the things that disturbs me about the New Testament church in, in the age in which we live, and this is not a criticism of every church, so please adjust it if it sounds that way, but churches are getting larger and larger. We have mega churches, mega ministries, all of those kinds of things. And it appears to me that in many cases that because of its size, because of its magnitude, because of just the number of people. I, I, I have a, a church uh, in the city in which I live, and they literally have over 70 people. I think it's 76 people that are on their payroll. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. I mean, that's from janitorial services to staff and Every, everything in between. But one of the things that we've done is that we've adopted the principles of the world. And the, we, we run the church as a business. It has to make money. It has to build buildings. It has to purchase land. It has to do all of those things. None of those things are bad. But we still can sometimes be caught up in running the church uh, according to the principles of the world and not according to Christ. Now that's the issue. How does Christ want his church to be run? It says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. And the phrase there, philosophy and empty deceit, refers to human opinions. Paul is talking here about all of the human insights and all the ideas and all of the human wisdom, if you would, and all of the intuition that men seem to have about spiritual issues. It's amazing. You can go into any bookstore. It doesn't have to be a Christian bookstore. And there are just a multitude of writers that have written about uh, spiritual things, and they're from A to Z. There's no telling what you may read in some of the literature that's out there. So it's not that I have Christ, but now that I need some human wisdom and human insight, you can take all of the great non-Christian intellectuals that have ever existed, all of the authors, all of the writers, all of the great cultural philosophers and thinkers, all of the renowned psychologists, all of the sociologists, all of the academic scholars of every age, and you can take everything that they have said and written about life and about morality and all of their solutions to all of the problems that men face, and they do not add and cannot add one iota to what it is that you have in Christ. Now that's a very, very strong statement. I mean, there are a lot of, there, there are so many ideas, there's so many philosophies, and here he calls it philosophy and empty deceit. It's things that actually deceive us, that take away, take away what it is that Christ wants us to have. We have to be very careful how we approach the scriptures, what our hermeneutics are, what the principles are that we use to interpret uh, what God is saying to us. And so the whole focus of men without Christ is to find meaning and purpose and reality in themselves, in what they know, in what they believe, in what they think, in their opinions, in their ideas, in their philosophies. But in doing so, they become disconnected at that moment from the very one who has created them in his image. And unfortunately for them, life is nothing but an exercise in futility 
And in the end, it leaves them without hope. It leaves them completely abandoned and separated from God forever. And so whatever success it is that they may enjoy today, because of their philosophy, because of their thinking, because of all of their creative ideas, I, I have to say to you at a personal level is I am one that is not willing to ever become creative with the Word of God. I'm not saying that you can't be creative. I'm not saying that you cannot be creative in some of your ideas and some of your approaches. I'm not saying that at all. But when it comes to the Word of God, I'm not going to be creative with it. I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to take away from it. I do not want to get fancy with the interpretation of something. Just let it say what it says. That's a fundamental rule that I think we all ought to live by. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 through 25, sums it up this way. It says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And so God says here, he says, he's made foolish the wisdom of this world. The way, the way that God approaches things is going to be different. We need to accept that than the way that the world and our cleverness and our ingenuity uh, uh, would lead us. So we don't want to be, get clever. We don't want to become clever with, with God's Word. We want to teach it. You want to teach it. If you are a pastor, if you are going into some kind of ministry, whatever it may be, you're going to have to open up the Word of God. You're going to have to communicate it to people, and you need to keep it very, very simple. I was thinking about the two great commandments that Christ gave to us, that of loving God and Loving our neighbor, very, very simple to understand. And really, those two things are so simple, yet at times they seem so very difficult to uh, integrate into our life properly. If I truly understand those two commandments, then what I understand is the absolute necessity for me to personally cultivate putting God first in every area of my life in my family life, in my church life, if I have a business, in my business life, in my prayer life, in my recreational life, in my missional life, whatever it may be, what, just whatever area it may be. You know, I, I uh, uh, am, have become over the years fully committed and dedicated to missions. Uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this in, uh, in one of the other studies, please forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but uh, our church, um, a number of years ago, probably 10 years ago, we determined that we wanted to begin to increase at a, a fairly significant level the amount of giving uh, and going, uh, the amount of giving that we gave to, the, uh, to missions. And today, uh, right now today, uh, my church uh, uh, gives anywhere from 65 to 70 percent of what comes in goes back out directly to missionaries. Uh, there's a few organizations that we support. Uh, there's some orphanages that we support, things of that nature. Uh, we're fully committed to the communication of the gospel. And so we, we, we determined that we did not want the Great Commission to become the Great Omission. And we have systematically, over that time, uh, added each year one or two missionaries that we give to. 
and then each year we try to um, add to what we are giving to them. I, I'll just if, if we decided to start off giving somebody $200 a month, then the next year we might give them 225 or 250 And you know, it's really amazing. I think at that time in the life of our church, uh, they were probably giving close to uh, 12 maybe 15%. And now we're right at almost 70%. And our goal is to be at 90%. And you know what the amazing thing is? And doing that is that God has provided for us to be able to do that. I think when we first started, I would never have dreamed that. I would never, ever in a million years thought that we would just get to 70% in a, in a fairly 65% in a fairly short period of time. But we did. And it has never hurt our church. We still function. We, we, uh, we don't invest in a lot of other things. We invest in people because we believe that uh, we, we want to put God first in that area. I know that many people would uh, not like me uh, saying that these things are uh, an absolute necessity for us to cultivate putting God first in every area of our life. I think it's the right thing to say, obviously, but it seems so very hard. It seems so absolutely demanding and so relentless and it is it is it requires concentration it requires incredible concentration to be to become what God wants us to become I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4 I want to read a fairly large section of scripture here so please follow along with me as I read have your notes there, obviously you can read with me. It says in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Now what I want to do is I want to emphasize the sort of imperative commands that God has given to us here. This is what is demanding. This is what becomes intense in our life to understand what it is that God wants us to do and then go and work that out in our salvation, in the salvific process of sanctification. Work that into our life so that the, the consequences may be worked out of our life and benefit other people. So we're not to walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Now, just go up to somebody that's lost and tell them that all of their thinking and all of their ideas are absolutely futile when it comes to the things of God. They will think that you're crazy. They will accuse you of being arrogant and proud and, and uh, no telling what else. A hypocrite, all of the kind of uh, uh, things that you would hear. This is what God says. It's not saying that people are don't have any wisdom relative to how to live in the world, but they, when it comes to spiritual matters, their mind and how they think is a futile thing. God wants us to think like he thinks. That ultimately is how we become Christ-like, is that we think like Christ. If you want to be like Christ, you have to think like Christ. It says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. That's quite a listing there of how God has evaluated the lost man and his thinking, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you Put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed. You could actually add the word you there again and you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So you've not learned Christ. You, you've learned as you studied the word of God, as you've been part a part of a God-honoring uh, uh, scripture teaching congregation 
if you're a pastor, hopefully you've been a great student, an excellent student relative to the things of God, and you have put off, you've put off concern, concerning your former conduct, and you are now putting on, and you are being renewed in the spirit of your mind. You've put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. You do not sin, and you do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor you give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. What is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers? And you do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And you be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now that's a mouthful. That's a life fool. There's, there's so much here, just beginning in verse 30 alone, of what we are to put off, what we are to put on. It takes tremendous effort. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen quickly. I don't think that any area of personal spiritual growth happens quickly. It happens over a period of time. There's testing of the things that God has worked into your life. There's a testing on the things that God is working out of your life. Things that he does not want to be there. And so each of these patches, passages are very demanding on every one of us. And they do not describe some kind of cheap, easy, non-demanding, laid-back, stress-free, and effortless Christianity. To the contrary, it takes great concentration and great commitment to live this way. Now, as we approach this area of concentration, I want to reiterate once again that if you do not have a deep desire for Christ-likeness, for the development of Christ-likeness within your life, then nothing that I am saying will mean much to you at all. Please forgive me if I sound arrogant in that. That is not my intent. But desire creates direction. And that's a very important principle that we have to understand. Until someone really wants to be Christ-like, and until that desire just consumes them, most likely they will remain as they are and their spiritual growth will be neg negligible, maybe even stunted. So here is the principle. Desire always creates direction in our life. People do what they want to do. If, if, if somebody wants to play golf, they're going to go play golf. If somebody uh, uh, wants to gamble, they'll go gamble. Desire always creates direction. And so I have to have a desire for Christ-likeness in my life. I, it has to be there. I, I've got to think about this. You know, I, I want to personally challenge you that you have to think about what it is that you believe God really wants for your life, evaluate it, and then you have to pursue it. It's, it'll be different for all of us, but the results will be the same. We will become more and more like Christ in our life. I've been a Christian for a long time, and I have to assure you that I have many areas in my life that I have to work on, and I may get to a place uh, in one area where I feel comfortable that, hey, I, you know, I've matured, I've grown in this area. Next thing I know, there's another area right there steering me right smack dab in the middle of the face. And I know that God is wanting me to work on that particular area of my life. Uh, and if, if, if we don't have this desire for Christ's likeness, then we will simply be headed in the wrong direction with our life. 
I think that I can accurately say that many believers do what they want to do. They make choices that they want to make. They live the way that they want to make. I mean, the way that they want to live. Uh, the way that they think actually satisfies and gratifies them the most. And most often what that produces, most often, when we think the way that we want to think, when we develop a lifestyle that we're comfortable with, listen, <clears throat> you cannot read the New Testament. You cannot read what it means to be a follower of Christ without it having a significant impact, not just on your life, but on your lifestyle. There's so many passages that are, are they're, they're confrontational when you get right down to it. They confront us with what it really means to be a disciple and to be a follower, to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And if we are not willing to take those demands seriously, and to just think the way that we want to think, uh, to honor Christ the way that we want to honor Christ, to, to give Him what we want to give Him. Uh, many times we're just giving Him the leftovers, just giving Him the crumbs of our time and of our efforts and of our resources and all of those kinds of things. And in that process, it produces a God-dishonoring lifestyle rather than a God-honoring lifestyle. And one, I think, that actually demeans and desecrates the person of Christ in his work on our behalf. When it comes to what God wants to give us and to do in our life in the area of Christ-likeness, it has to be appreciated that you cannot get something for nothing. You cannot get something for nothing. For instance, if you, if you really want an education, if what you're interested in here in your studies with uh, Covington, whether it's an online course, whether it's uh, uh, at one of the extensions that we have, whatever it may be, some other school that you've attended, if you want to get a good education, then you have to become a good student. You know, I, I say this uh, not with uh, the intent of being critical of uh, other students, uh, but over the years, over the, the many years that I've talked with Covington, uh, I've, I've had some incredible students. I've just had in, in some incredible uh, students. They've gone on. Uh, they've been men of God, uh, women of God. They, have, they were an encouragement to me. I mean, I just look forward to being in class with them. Uh, they were prepared. They did excellent work. Uh, I have a student in Romania, and uh, he, uh, uh, he has a 4-0. And as far as I know, as far as I know, I don't actually grade the papers. I have doctoral students that uh, grade the papers for me. Uh, but as far as I know, he has made 100 on every essay, on every writing assignment. Now you have to think about that for a minute. I think in all of the years that I have been grading essays, that I've only given a 100 as a grade to one student one time. In fact, I, I told him when I, when I uh, gave him his, uh, uh, you know, when I gave him his paper back in class, it was a little funny. I, I said there's. There's only, you only have one place to go from here, and that's down. And that's not to discourage you, but just, it takes a lot of effort to be a good student. You have to do a lot of reading. You have to do some study. You know, as a, as a seminary professor, I've been greatly encouraged by some students, and I have been incredibly discouraged by some. Men and women who I just, just, uh, I, I, I have a strong ministry of discouragement. Maybe that's really not an accurate um, scriptural uh, thing, but uh, I, I've had some terrible, terrible students 
they just weren't willing to make the effort. That's all it was. It was just a matter that they wanted a degree. They wanted a piece of paper that they could put on their wall, and that was it. And they weren't really interested in learning. It was too much work. Uh, some understand what excellence in the ministry requires, and others have no clue. I, you know, I would be highly disappointed, highly disappointed if I found out that my cardiologist barely passed in school and had the lowest grades on the state licensing exam of anyone taking the exam. I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't want to go to him. I wouldn't want him operating on my heart. I wouldn't want him giving me um, um, catheterizations and not knowing sort of the, the dangers with that. I've had a heart catheterization. I've laid there on the table and watched that thing moving around in my heart and, and all of that. Uh, one of our professors, one of the online professors, uh, wife just died. Uh, a couple of years ago, she had uh, went in for knee replacement, just a, a knee replacement. Um, and uh, uh, the, the operation appeared to be successful. She came out about a couple hours later. They had her up walking in the hallway. And right there in the hallway, she, uh, she just collapsed and died right there on the spot because they had not prop they had not given her the proper blood thinner uh, to keep the blood from clotting and, and uh, there was a clot in the blood and it went to the lungs and uh, she had a, uh, a lung clot and just collapsed there and died. They never were able to resuscitate her. What they found out is that that had happened to several other of this doctor's patients within the last year. Now, I wouldn't want to go to him. I, my wife's got to have her knee replaced. I wouldn't want her going to that particular doctor. I wouldn't let her go to that particular doctor. So you not only have to be willing to study, you have to actually study. Uh, just showing up for class will not really give you an education. For instance, if you have a certain goal for your life, you will never reach that goal unless you earnestly pursue that goal. You cannot, you will not get something for nothing. And likewise, you cannot be a godly person without doing godly things. You can't be Christ-like without doing things that Christ would do. You cannot get what's right by doing what's wrong. And in the same manner, you can never become Christ-like but doing those things that are Christ-like. So when we read passages like this that we just previously read and Letting all bitterness and wrath and anger clamor and evil speaking and not letting any corrupt word proceed out of your mouth and being kind and tender. You have to work those things into your life. That's what Christ likeness is. It's not doing these things. It is doing these other things. It's not the basis of your salvation. It certainly is the basis of your rewards. But you have to do them. You can't be Christ-like until you do Christ-like things. So often I have people say to me on um, uh, the way out of a service, Pastor, that was a really good message today, or Pastor, that really spoke to me today. And I appreciate them saying those kind of things. I do. I, I would be foolish to say that I didn't. Uh, it's a lot better than somebody saying, Well, that was terrible today, Pastor. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. I can't remember that I have. I'm not sure that I would enjoy it if it did happen that way. But you really, you know, you, if somebody came up to you and said, that was terrible today, Pastor, you really missed the boat on, on that particular issue. I don't think I would like that. But by the same token, the problem that we all have is that most often we mistake the truth of what we heard for the actual outworking of that truth in our life. That has got to be one of the major issues and problems in the local church is, is that we've become hearers of the word and not, and not doers of the word. We, our people are comfortable in just hearing the word. They, they can come, they can sit, they can listen, they can go through all of the motions of, 
of a Sunday service or a Wednesday night service or whenever it may be. They can go through all the motions of that. They can hear, and somehow they think that the hearing of the truth is the same thing as having that truth worked into your life. And so over and over the truth given is mistaken for the truth that is actually worked into our life. And there is a great, great snare in the Christian life of actually knowing the will of God as expressed in the Bible without the slightest practical outworking of it in our own personal lives. You know, I believe that if the Holy Spirit has given you a vision of what God truly wants for your life, and hopefully He has. Hopefully He has. You know, I, I don't know how God does all of that. He has many means by which He speaks to us through His Word and friends, through pastors, uh, uh, just so many different ways that God can minister to us and confirm things to us. It may be through a friend that loves you. It may be your marriage partner. But if, if God has given you a vision of what he wants, uh, then it's going to take a tremendous effort on your part to achieve that. It's going to take a tremendous effort on your part. It's going to take insight and discernment for that to become actual and real in your life. We have become absolutely disconnected between the, uh, between the truth and the outworking and application of that truth in our life. We are disconnected. The church is disconnected when it comes from the hearing of the word and the doing of the word. We, are, we, we as pastors have somehow created a spiritual environment that allows people to be comfortable with that. You know, my job as a pastor is to make people uncomfortable. It really is. It, it's, uh, you know, in teaching this class, it's a little bit different. There's not a whole lot of preaching that, that I'm doing in, in, this, in this particular class. It's more encouragement to you. You're, you're going to be in the ministry. You need to have the right tools. You need to have the right perspective. You need to have some conviction. You need to have some deep convictions about what God has called you to do. You need to live by those convictions. I would say that until... Uh, there are a lot of people that say they have convictions, but they don't live by those convictions. It's not a conviction. It's just an idea. It's not a conviction until it becomes real in your life and becomes a part of your life. You know, I have a, I, I have a, 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 a deep, deep conviction about a lot of different areas. But one of those areas as a pastor and as a teacher is that I'm never in a hurry. I, I am just never, ever in a hurry. I, 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 you will not, if, if you came to my church on a, on, a, on a Sunday morning, there's no telling how slow uh, a, a, a teaching may develop over a period of time. I started teaching the book of uh, Hebrews uh, about a year ago. And I told my church, and we're just doing the overview. We're, we're still on the overview of Hebrews, if you can believe that. Um, and, and, uh, and we're only in chapter 8. I, I still have 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 to go. In the overview um, of Hebrews. And then we're going to turn right around and go back and do a detailed exposition of every verse all the way through from chapter 1 all the way through the end of chapter 13. I'm never in a hurry. I'm, I'm not in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry tonight. If I get through, great. If I don't, great. Uh, there are plenty of courses that I teach uh, uh, where I just never get through. I give you my notes. I give you all of my notes. And I just never, ever get through with the class. Why? Because I'm not in a hurry. I'm not, I don't want to rush through God's Word. And it's, it's a conviction. And it's worked into my life. It's, it's a part of my life. It's the way that I think. It's the way that I approach the scriptures. Um, and we have just become disconnected between the truth and the application of that truth in our life. So when I use the word concentration, what I'm actually saying is that we must constantly concentrate on what we believe is God's will 
for our life until it actually becomes real to us, until it becomes second nature to us. Too often we hear a, a very vital and meaningful truth for our life, and God actually touches our life uh, with that, uh, with some spiritual in some spiritual way. But at that point, at that most critical juncture, what happens is that we do not follow through with what has been given to us. You know, I am uh, deeply committed to missions, to international missions. And, and uh, there are a lot of dangerous places that you can go. Uh, if, you know, once you get outside of the United States, uh, there's some comfortable places that people can go, and uh, I'm not sure that's where I want to go. Uh, in Zimbabwe, where we minister, it's, it's, um, the danger is probably more with the animals than anything else. There have been times when our teams have been approached by soldiers with guns. I remember uh, recently, uh, probably a couple of years ago, Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Ildefonso, um, we're out ministering and uh, about eight or nine truckloads of uh, soldiers with automatic weapons came up to them and, and uh, threatened them. Um, and, uh, but for the most part, it's, that's not something that happens every day. Uh, maybe the wild animals. Um, one of the homesteads that I was in recently um, uh, had been uh, destroyed the night before by uh, or parts of it destroyed the night before by wild elephants chasing a dog. And uh, when we go back to Zimbabwe the next time, our goal is to live in the villages, to go and stay, have the MREs, take us some water, um, and uh, take a few other things, and live and teach in the villages with the people there. Be there a couple weeks. Uh, it'll be very, very difficult. But it's not, it's, 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 it's what needs to be done. And so we have to concentrate on things we, we, until what we're doing actually gets worked out in our life. And it takes a lot of effort. It takes a tremendous amount of effort. I, I remember a number of years ago, I went to uh, one of the Together for the Gospel uh, meetings that they had in, in Louisville and David Platt who wrote Radical and Radical Together, uh, was speaking, and it was so powerful. And yet what he was talking about was that we had to be willing to die for the gospel. We had to be willing to, 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 be willing to die to take the gospel to places that had never heard it. And he gave some illustrations of, of, of people that that had happened to, and places that he had been in China where he was... They would move him around at night and hood him in so people couldn't see him and things of that nature. Um, a deep conviction. A deep conviction. It was He believed something about God's Word and now it was being worked out into his life. And so there are plenty of things that may move us, they may encourage us, they may stir us, but until they become worked out in our life, they have no meaningful value. They don't ever do anything for us. For the most part, it was just momentary, just something that happened, and we simply moved back into our, our normal routine of life. I think that happens at church all the time. People come, they'll be stirred, they'll be encouraged, their heart will be blessed, they will find the Word of God to strengthen them, and they walk out the door, and by the time they get home, they've forgotten everything that God was trying to do in their life. And they never implement it, they never allow it to really be worked into their life. And so we just move back into our normal routine of life and forget what it was that God was speaking to us about. We enjoyed it while we were at church. It was a comfortable place to be. It was a wonderful time that day. We had a great time. But it didn't do us any good. So once again, we have to concentrate. We have to give attention to these things. We have to focus on what we believe is God's will in our life until it actually becomes a part of of our life. You know, I don't, uh, I keep a journal. It's just a personal journal. I, 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 you know, when I'm studying and reading and meditating on the scripture, I just write things down. There are times when I write 
uh, I mean, I have a prayer journal, um, and uh, uh, I write those things down to, to just, uh, so I can see and remember some of the things that God has taught me and some of the things that God is doing in my life. I want them, what God's teaching me, to become a reality for me. Unfortunately, many segments of Christianity have created this environment that I mentioned earlier where we are just conditioned to be hearers of the Word of God. People go to church on Sunday morning and they hear the Word and they leave and ultimately they become spiritually conditioned to just being a hearer of the Word. And I'm sure, I'm positive that much of that is a failure on our part as pastors to constantly be challenging our people to taking them out of their comfort zone. I was uh, sharing my church recently uh, as I've gone through uh, the overview of Hebrews that one of my jobs is to create uh, a paradigm shift in, in, in their life. They're, they're, we have paradigms about the Christian life that they have to be changed. Uh, there are things that we believe that just simply are not effectual. They're not really out they're not providing the outworking of God in our life and through our life. And uh, I just think the Christian life takes a lot more than just hearing the Word of God. If you're going to be a good student, it takes more than just listening to these, to these videos here. It's going to take a lot more than that. You have to concentrate on what you personally believe to be the will of God in your life until it actually gets worked out in your life. There's so much here in the Scriptures that it's, you'll never get through with any of that. So you cannot become Christ-like. You cannot. You will not become Christ-like without tremendous effort and concentration. You have to concentrate. You have to find a way to keep reminding yourself of what it is that God wants in your life, of how God wants to work in your life. You have to do that. You have to work out your salvation. You have to work on you, you have to work on it, if I can say it that way. It's not that all of this is totally dependent on us, for it's not. Uh, we'll all fail miserably at times. There'll be areas of our life that we'll struggle with more than others. Uh, but by the same token, God is not going to work Christ's likeness into our life until until we have an attitude and are willing, uh, an attitude that wants Christ-likeness to be developed in us and are willing to make the effort to become Christ-like. For instance, something may happen in your marriage that creates tension or pressure, and if that happens, we need to be saying to our wife or to our partner, sweetheart, let's make sure that we respond in a Christ-like way. Let, let's make sure right now that we're going to let Christ-likeness prevail in us. We're not going to just sit around and, and say ugly things, uh, uh, spiteful things, demeaning things to one another. Uh, let's be Christ-like as much as is possible. You know, over the years, uh, I've done a lot of marriage counseling. I would say that it's the most difficult thing that I have to do. It's probably the one area of the ministry that I, 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 that I don't savor. It, it's, it's, it's just you become emotionally attached with people. Uh, people get started on the wrong foot. Uh, uh, you know, I, there are a lot of couples in churches that are divorced. And, uh, you know, they, they were divorced, they got remarried, and neither one of the partners ever ever uh, resolve the issues of their first marriage. So here you got two people that didn't know how to resolve issues. They come together and they have the same issues with each other. And and uh, I, it's just a very, very difficult area. And one of the things that I found, especially in counseling sessions, you probably found the same, is that sometimes you can just tell them immediately that couples, they just bite and devour one another. They don't know how to talk. They don't. They just react to things that are said. They don't haven't figured out what it, the difference between responding and reacting. So here's what we have to understand: concentration 
uh, I mean, consecration, consecration is not what works Christ-likeness into our life. You can go, you know, that was the first area that we had. You had, there had to be an area of constant consecration in your life. You, you have to want this. And you have to, there has to be a point in time in your life where you, where you commit yourself to what it is that God wants you to do. You know, the illustration that I would use with you is that after I got married, it was then that I had to begin to work on my actual marriage, not at the ceremony. I had to have the ceremony to start the process, but it was only beginning, and I've been working out the details of my marriage to my incredible, amazing wife ever since that day in August of 1971. I've been, I'm still working on it. I will be working on my marriage until I die. Um, I have a great marriage. I have an incredible wife. She is an amazing woman, and I love her to death. But I'm trying to figure out how to love her like Christ loved the church. And he was sacrificial. Uh, he taught the church. He gave his life for the church. What does all that mean? How do I work all of that out in my life? And so likewise, when God begins to bring into our life an area that he wants to touch and an area that he wants to change in our life, we have to inevitably pay for that through concentration after we have been given the truth and after we have consecrated ourselves to allowing him to do that work in our life. God will continually, continually, constantly bring circumstances into our life to make us prove whether or not we are actually and really willing to work out with a determined concentration that thing which he has, which he wants to work into our life. I will always be tested. You will always be tested at your consecration, relative to your consecration, your commitment, and your concentration with the things of God. You know, too often our people just become hearers only, often moved by the Word of God and touched by the Word of God, but still unresponsive to it. So you see, there, there has to be concentration. There has to be concentration. You know, I, uh, I certainly not everybody does it. It's just not something that everybody does. But I really, really encourage um, those people in my church. I encourage them uh, deeply to take notes so that they can go back and review. Uh, I send uh, my notes out to them. I, we maintain audios and they can... I can uh, put those in Dropbox and send them to them if they want them. Uh, many, many get them on a weekly basis. Um, but they, they, they have to concentrate. And once God reveals His will for your life, which is, is here in the Word of God, not just the actual daily kind of outworking of everything, but the general will of God for your life, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to me to begin to work that out in my life. And concentration is simply the result of our consecration to God. An individual who has never consecrated their life to Christ will have no desire whatsoever to concentrate on the things of God for their life. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. If you see people and they're not concentrating uh, I have a, a couple of young men in my church that I have uh, uh, actually this Sunday I am going to approach them uh, about discipling them. I, they're, they're two young men. They're, they're in their 20s. They uh, are godly men. They, they love the Lord. They're very faithful. Uh, and I just sense that God wants me to take them aside and to, and to disciple them. And uh, uh, and one of the things that we will talk about if they choose to do that is what it really means to be consecrated to God, to be a vessel of honor, to become a vessel of honor. And once that happens, once that takes place in their life, they say, yeah, that's really what I want. I, I really want to be a disciple of Christ. Then you have to concentrate on what it takes to become a disciple. So many Christians are just hanging on to Christ and the result is that there's a very large gap 
a lot of times between our profession regarding Christ and the practical outworking of that profession in our lives. Most Christians live far below what it is that they profess. I mean, if you were to just think about all of the professing Christians that you know, and, and I'm not saying by using that term that they are not saved, but I would use it in a sense that they may not be fully dedicated and committed to the things of God in the way that they should be. And so, um, just think of all the people that you know that have made some kind of religious profession, and, and, but it's not being worked out into their life. Most Christians live far below what it is that they profess. And we are most likely on the outskirts, most, most Christians uh, that we know here in America especially, are probably most likely on the outskirts of what it really means to being fully devoted to Jesus Christ. And we're incredibly thankful for the gift of salvation, but too often we just do not do anything toward allowing it to be worked into our life. The only meaningful character is the character of Christ that is being made, that is being manifested through us. That's the only thing that's meaningful. You know, uh, somebody may think I'm a nice guy. They may think I'm not a nice guy. But when it really gets down to the bottom line, the issue is not whether I'm a nice guy. The issue is whether or not I am Christ-like in, in my behavior and in, in my life. And so if this thing that we call sanctification, this thing that we call Christ-likeness, does not work itself out in our actual life, then it is simply a doctrine. It's simply just words. It's just an idea that has no meaningful value to us. It's not just that the work of God's marvelous grace has been performed in our heart, and, but more so that it has now actually become evident in our life. That, it, it, that somebody can see the difference uh, in our life. Christ-likeness is that place in our life where our whole life is constantly being brought under the control of Jesus Christ. So we have defined concent concentration as a very strong and deliberate giving of our attention to what we believe to be the will of God for our life. And it carries the idea of holding our mind on something, thinking and deliberating and contemplating on something very specific. You cannot keep your Christian life under the umbrella of all the generalities. You have to become specific. It has to be worked out specifically. There has to be some attention to detail. My wife, bless her heart, is a detail nut. She is just, she's into the details of everything. And uh, I, I mean, if, if, if I were to do the dishes, uh, we, our, our uh, dishwasher broke down a, a, a while back and I haven't had it repaired. I, it's, it's, I have to take the whole countertop off unfortunately, to get to it. And so we all been pitching in and washing the dishes. Well, the, uh, the terrible part for me is that after I finish washing the dishes, my wife may go back and look at them to see if I actually cleaned them the right way and if I used the, the right amount of soap and scrubbed it properly and rinsed it off with hot water and if it left any little marks on it. She is just a, she's a nut about the detail of those kind of things. And I'm glad for that. I like that about her. I like that. We have to get into the detail. So, if you never think about becoming Christ-like, then you will never become Christ-like. I think about becoming Christ-like all the time. It's a constant, it's, you know, I'm always um, thinking about my demeanor and, and how I am to respond and how I am to act in certain situations. Um, uh, yesterday, I, I, I took some stuff down to the Salvation Army. Uh, we had been cleaning out our garage and just had some things uh, 
uh, and so I took them down to the Salvation Army, and uh, this lady came out, um, and she, um, I, I was uh, helping unload these things, and some of them were heavy. We had some chairs and things, and I, I told her, I said, please let me, let me do this. And she says to me, this was really great, she, this was encouraging to me, she says, she says, I know you. She says, do you remember who I am? And I, I looked at her and I, I just couldn't, I didn't remember. And then she gave me her name and immediately I remembered who she was. And she was the lady that had gotten saved and actually she came over to our house when my children were young. I mean, my children are 38, 36, and 34. And this is when they were, we were homeschooling them and uh, the lady had met my daughter. She had gotten saved and they came over, she came, she would come over to our house almost every day for a while and then she moved off and I had not seen her since that time. And she said to me, uh, she said, I recognized your voice and I recognized uh, your Christ-likeness in helping me. I, I was, I went, wow, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, what a blessing, what a blessing. For her to to say that you know before I, I developed this part of our studies God had been working with me for months on on the issue of Christ likeness and every what bothered me about it is that every commentary or systematic theology book that I read they all seemed to say the same thing they would say in in one way or another that the goal of sanctification was Christ likeness but I was confused because I never could find a place in any of that where this idea of Christ-likeness was actually being developed into their theology. And I just could not get it out of my mind. I, I could not get these things out of my heart. And, uh, and ever since that time, uh, I have... God has helped me to focus on what it really means to be Christ-like and to become more and more Christ-like in everything that I do, everything. Concentration is that area of our life that allows us to understand what it is that God wants for our life. You've got to think about this. You've got to be a little cerebral about what it is God wants for your life. You know, if you went through the scriptures and... Let's say, for instance, that on a daily basis that you would read through, say, three or four chapters of some of the New Testament epistles every day. Well, if you wrote down all the things, those imperative commands, uh, the, the, those things where God is telling you to do something, you would have a list that was just probably longer than you could manage. But I'm telling you that, uh, uh, excuse me for saying it that way, I'm encouraging you to appreciate that you have to know what they are. And then you have to be willing to allow God to sort of, sort of highlight those areas in your life. You know what you need to work on may be completely different than what I need to work on. You have a whole different set of circumstances. You're involved in a completely different ministry. You're in a different location. You have a different background, different kind of history, a different kind of family life. You may be younger than I am. You may be older than I am. Uh, there may just be things that God is doing and wants to work into your life, and you have to determine what they are and then concentrate on them so that you can become, you can understand what it is that God wants for your life. Uh, I may have previously and sincerely consecrated my life to God, and to the different areas of my life, but after that, I have to understand what it is that he desires for my life. Listen, nobody's on spiritual autopilot here. They may put the airplane on autopilot, but they don't. God doesn't put the Christian life on autopilot. To the contrary, our becoming Christ-like will require a tremendous effort and concentration over our entire life. Very often we have failed to realize that the Christian life demands a very intense intellectual effort. You know, I'm teaching through Hebrews, um, 
And chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10 are probably, in my estimation, the most doctrinal section of Scripture anywhere in the Bible. I just, I'm not sure that you can find anything more deeply doctrinal. It's, uh, it's talking about, uh, uh, you know, the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ on our part. I don't write, relate well to priests. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not in a church where we have priests. And I don't relate well to that concept. And I, I have to struggle. I struggle a little bit with how to, how to communicate all of these things. And then, and the way that I study is I have a whole list of things, uh, probably 16 to 18 different items that I look for in a passage. And, and before I ever open up a commentary, ever, I go through those things, I write them down, I take the notes, I write down the applications of those things, as I said, and then I'll go back and I'll read the commentaries to either confirm or not confirm what it is that I think the scriptures are saying. There's some things that I, I need some help on. Uh, historically, there's some things I can't understand. I can do the word studies and find out the tenses of the verbs and all of that kind of stuff and do the parsing and, and be comfortable in that. But, but it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of intellectual effort. At the end of the day, some days I am exhausted. I am absolutely intellectually, mentally exhausted from the effort that it takes. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so this verse speaks of the process of sanctification where the Holy Spirit helps us, but Paul uses the word you when saying that we are the ones that have to put to death the deeds of the body. It simply takes concentration. It takes great concentration to do that. We're to be constantly working out in our mind and in our heart what it is that God specifically desires of us and specifically what it is that we have to do to become Christ-like. If I want to be a good husband, if I want to be a good pastor, I have to concentrate on that. If, 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 if I am going to actually love my wife as Christ loved the church, you know, that verse there in, in Ephesians chapter 5 changed my life. It was one of, those, one of those passages of Scripture. I'm just reading along one day. This is years and years ago. And I'm just reading along, and, and I, I get to that verse where it says that husbands are to love their wife like Christ loved the church. I was, I was kind of in shock, spiritual shock, at what it really meant and what it was actually saying to me. It was actually telling me that I could love my wife like Christ loved the church. That was God's demand on my life. Man, I, I, I completely refocused. I did. I, I, I made a tremendous effort. I, I, I told my wife I, I was going to do everything I could to love her like Christ loved the church. And so, if you want to be a good husband or a good pastor, a good wife, whatever it is, you have to give your attention to that. And if I want to be Christ-like, I have to give my attention to that. Now, you may be there thinking, well, Gary, you have told us this a thousand times. Well, that's good. That's good because it may be one of those areas of our life in a practical way that we just have never concentrated on. And we need somebody to kind of get in our face and say, hey, look, this is what you need to be concentrating on. In your life. I, I have to learn what God wants me to become and how he wants that to work itself out in my life and then I have to be committed to it. I have to concentrate on it or it will never happen. You can live your entire Christian life understanding all the things that God wants to happen in your life but they never actually become practical. There has to be some concentration. I was talking to someone and we we're discussing this very area and the comment that was made to me was so very accurate accurate the individual said that at times that at times that it was 
such a struggle to respond in a Christ-like way to something that was very difficult and emotionally taxing and draining, even personally demeaning at times. And I agreed 100%. I, I, I did. I, I said, Brother, I, I, I agree with you 100%. But we, there's always a struggle. There's always a struggle. There's always going to be a test. There's always going to be a trial or multiple trials and multiple struggles in those areas that God wants to work into our life. You have to know that. You have to expect that. You have to know that that is what is coming. The Christian life is, like I said earlier, we're not on autopilot here. And there are things, there, there are the means of grace that God is using to work things into our life. And part of those means of grace are the struggles and the trials that we have to go through. Think it not strange for the fiery trial that's come among you for the testing of your faith, Peter says. Uh, James talks about the same thing in chapter 1. And so we have to appreciate that the actual struggle is the spiritual setting for Christ-likeness to become real within us. There has to be this testing. We will never become Christ-like without being placed into some very difficult circumstances where we're called on by God to respond to the difficulty in a way that we do not want to respond. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 puts it this way, For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Well, they're contrary. I'm, not, I'm never going to get rid of my flesh. It's always going to be there debating with me, trying to convince me to do something else. It never will, not one single time will it ever encourage me to do the right thing. There will always be this struggle. There will always be this place of conflict, a place of disagreement, a time of discord and tension, of controversy and argument and differences. And normally they will be, unfortunately, with other people. Normally, that's where the real trials come. They are unavoidable. Just listen to me. They are unavoidable. And they're absolutely necessary if you ever want to become Christ-like. Be prepared. Be prepared. I, I have a... I have a... Uh, you know, I, I, as a pastor, I, I've been here for 18 years, and... Um, I can honestly say that I've never really had any, any kind of major issue in our church ever. Uh, people left that didn't maybe like me or they didn't like the length of the services or my preaching style or whatever it is. And every, every church is not for everybody. You know, every pastor is not for every, every, every Christian. Um, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, but there have been times um, when, um, when you just have to respond to things in a Christ-like way. And one of the, well, I read through Proverbs every day. I read, I read through one chapter a day on the date. On the date. Uh, on the date. And, uh, you know, they have verses in there about self-control. And one of the verses is that a soft answer turns away wrath or anger. And you know, I, I've learned that verse. <laughs> I've, I've honestly learned how, how that can be worked into my life. Uh, and the only way it can be worked into my life is that somebody become angry. Normally, I think it would be more family members than church members. Uh, my church members don't. <laughs> I can't remember the last time somebody was angry with me at church, but um, it's just simply a matter of a, a soft answer. It turns away wrath. You know, in marriage counseling, I use that a lot. Uh, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. You just can't keep, you can't keep contending about things. Uh, if there's no wood, the fire will, will go out. So just don't put any more wood in, into the fire. There will always be these, these struggles. And uh, here's 
Here's the question. What would Christ want me to do? What, would, what is Christ's likeness in this situation? We have to concentrate and give our attention to that question, and we have to place his will above our will. What would he want me to do? Would he want me just to speak my mind? Probably not. Probably not at all. Would he want me to have my way? I don't think so. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 through 23 says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Well, that's, that's what God has called me to do, right? He suffered for us. He's left us an example. Why did he leave us the example? So that we could follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. I love this verse. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return, and when he suffered, he did not threaten. This is the phrase that just ministers to me so much every time I read it. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. He had learned how to take his life and the difficult things in his life and to just commit them to his heavenly Father. So we want to now look at the third in our trilogy of words, and it's the word commitment. And I have to apologize again that I'm not using biblical words. That's uh, something I don't like. I, 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 would, I want to use Bible words, but I know that I'm not using a Bible word here. And the word consecration is only used in the Old Testament and only in two books. The other two words that I've chosen are not used in Scripture at all. And to be quite honest with you, I'm not much on alliterations. You don't find in my notes as we go through here, Point one, point two, point three, and everything starts with the same, with the same letter. In fact, uh, at my church, when I have, if I ever have something in an alliteration, I, I feel so strongly about this. I don't see that. That I don't see a lot of that in the scripture and the messages that were preached, and I've just adopted that. It's not that it's wrong. It's certainly not that it's wrong. Sometimes in church, I'll apologize. For it, but I'm sure you probably use alliteration, so don't don't mistake what I just said. So from that perspective, I want to be careful not to fabricate ideas and give ideas to you that have no scriptural basis. Uh, and I want to be very careful. Uh, I get nervous. I'm, I'm one of. The, I get nervous. I become nervous when I do not use biblical terms. And so I'll try to be very careful. I, I want to reiterate once again that my goal in all of this is not just to give you a list of things that you can do to become Christ-like. You know, concentrate, uh, you know, consecrate, concentrate, commit. Uh, but there, there are things that we have to do. I mean, there are just things. If I'm going to properly live out the Christian life, there are just some things that we have to do. That's just not my intention. Christ likeness is not a formula. This is not A plus B equals C. It's, it's not that at all. Not some kind of spiritual recipe that we just apply to our life. Take a little bit of this, take a little bit of that, kind of mix them up, and then everything comes out great. You might could use that analogy, and it might be appropriate in some cases. But I, that's, it's, this is something that takes incredible heart and effort. This has to be desirous. This has to be something that deep inside of us that we intently desire for our life. Something that we are passionate about. I, I hope that you are passionate. I hope that that passion comes out in your teaching and in your preaching or in the ministry that you are engaged in. Whatever it may be. If, if you don't have any passion, uh, I say this uh, graciously to you, not in a way that would demean where you are in your Christian life. If you don't have any passion about what it is that you're doing, uh, I would encourage you to reevaluate whether or not God even wants you in the ministry. You have to be passionate. But these, what we're talking about here, this thing about becoming Christ-like, is something that every Christian ought to be passionate about. It's not just something that we can have just because we may say that we want it. It's costly, it's demanding, it's difficult, it's time consuming, at times the cost will be more than you may want to pay and the challenge is greater than you want to overcome. 
For many people, Christ-likeness will never be much more than just a concept. I keep talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it intentionally so that it becomes embedded. It's something that becomes embedded in us. It, it's just a part. It's just second nature to us. And I don't think that that is normally the case. And uh, a lot of people just, they don't think that the cost is worth the effort. They don't, they just think it, 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 they don't think that the challenges are worth it and that the effort required is worth it. And so, uh, for those of us that have decided that it is, the blessings are far more greater than we can even imagine. And just like the word concentration, the word commitment is not used in the scriptures. And so I realize that I'm out somewhat on a limb with, here with this concept, so just, just adjust it if you're not comfortable with it. But concentration leads to commitment. What I have desired to have, which is concentration, and what I've given my life to learn, which is concentration, must now issue forth in devotion or commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. My, my marriage, my marriage will have absolutely no lasting or meaningful value unless I am devoted to my wife, unless I am committed, fully com I'm fully committed to her. Um, I may have had the ceremony all along the way and I may have learned by concentrating on some meaningful things to do, but until I'm committed to doing those things in my life, it will all have been for nothing. So commitment just simply refers to a person's dedication to something or someone and to their faithfulness and steadfastness to what they believe is right. Once you've consecrated your life to Christ and once you have learned the discipline of concentrating on what he desires for you relative to becoming Christ-like, then you have to commit yourself to that purpose. You have to have this area of commitment. It just does not happen without it. You know, you may, you may, a number of years ago, you may have consecrated your life to the ministry to the study of the Word of God. And over the years, you may have concentrated on what it takes to be a good student and, and uh, to be somebody that rightly divides the Word of Truth. But you may not have done that. You may have all the principles. You may have taken a course on hermeneutics. You may have taken a course on homiletics and how to teach and how to preach. And you know all the principles of hermeneutics, and you've got all of that down pat, but you're not committed. You're not committed to studying the Word of God. Listen, that's, if you're going to be in the ministry, that is your job. I'm giving you your job description. I, there may be some other things under there, but if you're going to stand up before people and take this Word of God and communicate it to them on a regular daily basis, on a regular weekly basis, however it may be, whether it's a small group or a large congregation or whatever it be, you have to be committed. You have, you have to get up every day with an attitude that says, I am committed to the Word of God. You have to commit yourself to that purpose. There has to be a time in your life where you're willing to become faithful to what you know is right and what you know is godly. And this involves every area of your life. There are some qualities that you may have that you know are not Christ-like. I've given a list here. You can read them in your notes. An outburst of anger. Uh, I struggle with an uh, outburst of anger once in a while. Uh, uh, it might be a tendency to always speak your mind. That's not a good thing. That's not. A, in fact, if you go through Proverbs, you'll find that what's important is that God wants to draw wisdom. He wants to draw wisdom. Out of, uh, you, you have to draw wisdom out of a, a wise man. He's just not speaking and giving his opinion about everything to everybody 
all of the time. Um, it may be selfishness. It may be bitterness. I know so many people that are bitter. <laughs> it's amazing. I know so many people that are bitter. Somebody said something to them. They didn't like it. Uh, something may have happened in their life, and the next thing you know, they are just bitter. Uh, there may be some ungodly moral habits in your life. I pray not. There may be some unkind... You may have a tendency just to, in speaking your mind, you just say things that are unkind to people. Um, you may just speak uh, impatiently. Uh, you may be impatient. You may be spiritually lazy. I know a lot of Christians. I know a lot of men in the ministry that I think are very, very lazy. I mean incredibly, incredibly lazy. They, um, they just are not given to the things of God whatsoever. Uh, they're people that are very self-centered in their life. They, they, they wouldn't sacrifice for anybody. They got their life to live and they can, other people take care of themselves. Well, that may be good for a while, but it's not going to be very satisfying if you want to be Christ-like. And so by the same token, there's some quality, qualities related to Christ-likeness that you know uh, that you do not have. Some good qualities. Faithfulness, long-suffering, patience. Uh, forgiveness, um, just positive things that you need to work on. So be, part of becoming Christ-like is this readiness and this uh, motivation to acquire these godly habits uh, and to simply let go of those things that are ungodly. John chapter 12 verse 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. It produces much fruit. So there's this dying process that has to take place in the life of every committed believer. There are things I have to die to. I have to die to them before they're ever going to produce any fruit. I, I have an organic garden, and I, I love my garden. I love what I get out of it. I love how much I get out of a small space. And... But I have to put the seeds in the ground and they have to die. Then I water them and fertilize them and the next thing I know they're growing. And so uh, you have to commit yourself uh, to, these, to these things. John, um, John chapter 12 uh, says, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just read that, forgive me. Uh, we will never grow until we learn this lesson. Uh, there are things that God just wants to die in my life. John chapter 3 verse 30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And we only decrease as we allow His life within us to increase. And He only increases in us as we nourish His life by that which decreases us. We have to be patient have to be patient in allowing God to bring about very difficult people and difficult circumstances into our life in order to allow his godly attributes to be developed in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12 says, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so then death is working in us, but life in you. So the closer that you walk with Christ, the more sensitive you will become over things that you never even thought about previously. Christ is constantly scrutinizing our lives to make right what is wrong, and we have to be aware that I have to appreciate and understand that God is at work in my life. But what is he at work doing? What is it? Is it, is it he just making us scholars? I don't think so. Is that a part of being in a, in a ministerial position? Certainly it is. You need to be a theologian. You need to be learned about certain things. But God primarily is working on the areas of my character, the areas of your character. And he's scrutinizing our life. And then he's doing things to make us aware 
that that's an area of our life that he wants us to work on. We have to become committed to that work of Christ within us. That work, his work of correcting us, his work of tra changing us, his work of transforming us and making things that are wrong right. That is the issue of Christ likeness. And unfortunately, most of the time, we're not really willing to let God scrutinize us and to challenge us and to confront both our life and our lifestyle. You know what Christians do? They just simply justify everything. They just justify everything. It's like a church that justifies just giving money to missions but never sending anybody, never going. I have a great friend there I mentioned... Uh, who's the pastor in Auburn, right now, today, this moment, right now, this day, they have over 80 missionaries on the field, 80, that have been directly called from their church. 80. Now, I, I, I pastor a much smaller rural church. Uh, we're not, we're, you know, we would probably we'll never have 80 people that, uh, but... They, have, they are fully committed to these things, and God has challenged in them. And so we don't want to just rationalize and justify that, hey, I, everybody else is supposed to go. I'm supposed to go. You're supposed to go. The Great Commission has been given to the church for the church to go. Every church ought to be involved in areas of evangelizing, not just locally, but all over the world. We, look, look, we can do that today. Now, this is a constant battle. His will versus my will, and his ways versus my ways. Listen to some of these verses I want to read to you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says that we are to pursue holiness, pursue peace with all people, and holiness. You pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says that we are to abstain from immorality. Abstain. I am to abstain, to stop, to not be doing things that are immoral and ungodly. Uh, uh, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says that we're to cleanse ourselves. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, but also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, brother, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. There's no place in the New Testament that alludes to any kind of spiritual shortcut by which we can become Christ-like. It does not exist. I mean, just think of all the things I read. Pursuing holiness, abstaining from sexual immorality, cleansing ourselves, giving all diligence, adding to our faith and virtue, and all of these things. The New Testament is constantly encouraging us to yield ourselves to that which honors Christ. It is something that we have to choose to do. It's a choice. It's always a choice. We're all a byproduct of the choices that we make in our life. And unless you make that choice, Christ-likeness will not become a part of your life to any substantial degree. Unfortunately, our tendency is to kind of push down God's barriers. There are some trees of which God says, you shall not eat. And yet we ignore his warnings and we disregard his caution. We disregard his counsel. Just think of all the people that you know that have been gotten married literally to the wrong person. They married an unbeliever. They disregarded. They pushed down God's barriers. And now their life and their family and their children, they're suffering from it. They've gotten a divorce. Just so many areas. And the problem is that the more that we push down God's barriers, the more into contact with forces and things that we cannot control, we will come into 
contact with spiritual forces and things that we just simply cannot control. And things will begin to control us. I say this as sincerely as I know how, but if you engage in things in your life that you know are not Christ-like, things that are dishonoring to Christ, things that demean his person, then in all likelihood you will suffer the pain and the consequences from which God will not protect you. You will reap what it is that you sow. I will reap what I sow. If I sow to the flesh, I will reap corruption. That word means to bring into a lower state. There simply are certain kinds of moral disobedience that produce emotional and physical sickness that no physical remedy can touch. We've become a culture that's addicted to drugs. We're addicted to stimulants. It's amazing all these conditions that young children seem to have and people take antidepressants. We push ourselves for physical and sexual pleasure and ultimately find that it only creates emotional and mental depression. I, it is just amazing to me. I am stunned. I'm shocked at the number of people over the years that I've had to deal with that are just, they come in and they're emotionally and physically and mentally and they are depressed some of them, they have had to go to these, uh, we have a place here where I lived, uh, where I live. It's a part of the hospital system, and it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a mental depression place you send people. And I've been there to visit with people, and it's just, people are just, there's just something that has just broken down in their life just fallen apart. There's some very real God-designed barriers that are there to protect us, and if we go outside of those, there's no guarantee that God will protect you from those things. The word where it says uh, uh, we, we reap what we sow, we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption. That word corruption means to bring into a lesser state, to a lower state. You're here and it brings you down to a lower state. That is a spiritual law. It is not going to change. It doesn't change if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. It applies to all of us. And if we overstep those boundaries, invariably we will reap the consequences and we cannot change God's laws. They're unchangeable and the consequences are, are inevitable. We live in a Christian culture that has deluded people into a sense of false security about life and about eternity. Everybody seems to think that they're saved. In my opinion, that's all that it is, is that many people are just simply living under the illusion that they're saved when in reality they are not. We live in a world of spiritual ignorance and spiritual blindness and probably Revelation 3 and its comments about the last day's church puts, makes it even worse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 sums up the issue when it states, but even if our gospel is veiled, hidden to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. It is veiled to those who are perishing. And the God of this world has blinded these people so that the gospel of Christ does not shine out in their life. Here are men who have multiple problems. I mean, you just look around and you talk to people, they have so many issues in their life and they've been blinded and they are literally perishing and they do not and are not willing to believe in Christ. They have become spiritually ignorant. And the result is that they have become blind to the very thing that they absolutely need the most. Here is what actually happens. Men turn their backs on what they innately know is true because they do not want it to be real. 
They simply do not want the truth to be real in their life. They have a misunderstanding of the truth, and so they reject it. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 expresses that truth this way, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, and professing to be wise, they become, became fools. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. You know, when I look at the life of Christ, the one thing that stands out to me is that he grew spiritually by obeying his Father. N nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. The same way, that is how you and I grow. We grow by a life of simple obedience. Just simple, fundamental, everyday obedience, doing what it is that we know God wants us to do. That is how we are sanctified. Obedience is the key to sanctification. Ne negatively stated, no, no one ever becomes Christ-like by continually being disobedient. I don't know of one single person. I don't know of one single person. I don't know if I've ever, I, I know that I, I've never met anyone who was a disobedient Christian that has become Christ-like. I was thinking earlier about what I often refer to in my church as the presence of Christ. It's a very important kind of principle to me. And as I thought about that phrase and what it meant to me personally, I could not help but think that in some way, the very presence of Christ in my life and in our church is dependent on how, of what we think about Christ. In other words, if we just have kind of a casual, indifferent, lethargic opinion about Christ, we might say all the right things, all the religious terms, and make all the right comments and read the right verses, but we just have a very kind of casual, indifferent perspective on the person of Christ, then I doubt very seriously that we're going to experience the presence of Christ in our life. I doubt that your church will ever experience the power of God working mightily and, and I would say in supernatural ways in your church if you're a prayerless church. I just doubt that's ever going to happen. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen the power of God being demonstrated in a prayerless church. I've seen the power of God being demonstrated in a prayerful church, but never in a prayerless church. In some way that I'm not sure I fully understand, I believe that it is the very presence of Christ within my life. It's His presence in me. It's His life functioning in me that gives me the power and the strength to live a life that actually honors Him. And too often I think that we are afraid of his presence because he, we know that he's going to speak to us about different areas of our life. It may be a, a sin in our life. Well, hallelujah. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we ought to want? But if we know that we're not willing to make the changes, if we know deep down inside of us that we personally are not that committed to the things of God in our life, then in all likelihood, we will kind of resent and resist these things of God in our life. Too often I think that we are afraid. It could be our temper. Maybe you've been unloving towards somebody that is unlovable. Uh, or maybe you've not been forgiving or you're having a compromising fellowship with the world and the things of the world. Or life has always been centered around you and what you want. And you're, you're dead level set that you're going to do what you want to do. Well, first thing God can do is to give you what you want. That's the last thing you want God to do in your life. And so we become afraid that if we allow Christ into our life that he will speak to us about those things and invariably, we close the door to the only one who really can bless us and help us. It's really a very strange thing, to say the least. Let me put it negatively and then positively, and then I'm going to close. 
As long as you want to walk on a lower level than Christ, and as long as you want to have the world and self, do not expect to have the presence of Christ in your life. If you want to live down here, if that's where you want to stay, then I would think that the presence of Christ, he's in your life, but the presence of Christ operating in your life will not be what it should be. But when you commit yourself to Christ, when you as a born-again believer, when you as someone who's been redeemed by the incredible precious blood of Christ through his death, resurrection, you've committed yourself to Christ and what you know is Christ-like, then you will have the very presence of Christ working mightily in you. Let me say it this way. Commit yourself to becoming Christ-like. Concentrate, uh, consecrate yourself. Uh, concentrate and commit yourself to becoming Christ-like. Concentrate on those things that you know that will reflect Him in your life. And when you do, you can be assured that He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want to thank you. This has been, uh, this is our last session, and I pray that over this time that what we've done, what we've said has been beneficial and meaningful to you. I pray that you will take these things, use your notes as a resource for your life and for your ministry. I would like to close, if you don't mind, uh, just by simply praying for you and for God's blessing on your life. Please uh, bow your head with me as we pray. Father, I thank you for these incredible, amazing students. I thank you for their love for you and for the diligence that they have provided uh, uh, in just studying and uh, listening to these videos and doing their work, doing their reading, taking the tests, writing their essays. And Lord, even though I don't know them personally, I, I do know that you are at work in their life and that as they consecrate themselves to you, as they concentrate on the things that are right and godly, that you, uh, Lord, will help them to be committed to you and you will bless their life, be an encouragement to them. May you strengthen each one of them, Father. May you give them all the tools that they need to live a God-honoring life, to be the kind of ministers of the Word of God in the ministries that you've given them, for those that are pastors, for those that are involved in other kind of ministries that they would be strengthened and that they would find that this incredible, amazing work of the Holy Spirit in their life is so very real and so very purposeful and so very meaningful for what you've called them to do. May they never ignore or neglect his work, this work of the Holy Spirit within them. And may they always be becoming Christ-like more and more each day of their life so that you can use them in a great and mighty way. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we ask all of these things. Amen.